This is part two for the annotated bibliography assignment. We're going to be looking at the issue of accounting for sources on MLA and APA documentation systems. If you don't know what this room is, you may have uh, think you've seen it before. It's the main reading room in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. If you've ever seen those Nicolas Cage movies, uh, National Treasure, this space or a space purporting to be this space appears in it. I think you can probably see Nicolas Cage up here in the upper right looking for that book he was looking for in the first of the National Treasure movies. Um, the Library of Congress, by the way, is a repository of one copy of every book ever published in the United States of America. And it's a place that is designed uh, by Congress to be a resource for scholars and, in fact, for the general public. You can't just check out a library book from there, like the county or city libraries here in St. Louis. But you can go there uh, and access textbooks or access books uh, and movies and sound recordings and photographs. They have an extraordinary collection. Um, I've actually done some research there years ago, that and then the National Archives. Um, on a pro for a scholarly project I was working on. So if you have a reason to use these, if you have some scholarly purpose, you can go use, their, use it. Uh, it really is a national treasure. I'll, I'll give Nicholas Cage that. Documentation, very simply, is all about giving credit and taking credit. You give credit to the sources that you've used, and you take credit for your own thinking and your own language. Okay. The whole point of documentation is to avoid plagiarism, uh, and it gives credit where credit is due, and it makes it clear who wrote what. Also, if it's done right, it can add credibility to your own argument, which is really what you want to do. Uh, this goes back to this idea of ethos. It's part of that process of making you a credible writer, a credible commenter on the particular issue you've assigned yourself. Any documentation system sets the appearance or layout of an entire paper. Uh, it sets the header, it says where the page numbers go, it sets the margins, it does all that kind of stuff. It also may set conventions in terms of punctuation and spelling, even grammar choices. Uh, APA is particularly restrictive with regard to grammar choices. Um, if you do decide to use APA, I'm not so much worried about that uh, as I am about getting the format right. but. Um, the more you work with APA, the more you're going to find that they have some very strict rules on what kind of language you can use. And the third thing that a documentation system sets is accounting for sources. What we, what we tend to look at is documentation itself. MLA and APA are what are called in-text citation systems. That is, you put the minimum amount of information inside the body of the paper to move people to the maximum amount of documentation, which is on your works cited page, or in APA, they call it a references page. Okay. There's a whole bunch of other systems. Uh, ones that you may have heard of is the Chicago Manual of Style or Turabian. It's because it was invented by a woman in the 20s uh, named Kate Turabian. Uh, she was a librarian at University of Chicago. And it's what's called an author date or footnote style. There's two different options with uh, Turabian. Uh, Academic disciplines that use it, you'll see a lot of historians will use uh, CMS. You'll also see a lot of academic publishing, and some social science houses will also use it. It's not as common as it used to be, um, but it's still a very powerful force, and it's kind of, some people regard it as the gold standard of documentation. Council of Science Editors, this is what's called citation sequence or name date, and that's one where you list your sources in the order in which they appear in the paper, not alphabetically like we do with MLA or APA on a works cited page or a references page. And then in engineering, there's different uh, citation systems for each engineering discipline. If you're a petroleum engineer, you have your own system. If you're an electrical engineer, you have another. If you're a civil engineer, you have a third. If you're a mechanical, you have a fourth. There's a million different ways to, well, not a million, but there's, there's dozens of different ways to do it. Uh, scholars estimate that worldwide there may be up to 500 different documentation systems that international uh, consortia of scholars develop their own. The United States uses, again, basically MLA, APA, CSE, or CMS by and large, uh, unless you get into engineering where you're going to find a lot of very specific ones that are determined by the publications in that business. By the way, this library is the National Library of Ireland. It's a Trinity College in Dublin. 
and this is where the famous Book of Kells is located, one of the oldest texts in uh, Western Europe. Basic rules for MLA and APA are very similar. Minimum in-text citation, as I've said, using the author last name or a shortened title of the work if you don't have an author name, and then page numbers if you have them. If you put the title in the text that is in the body of your sentence or you put the author name in there, you don't need to repeat it in the parentheses part. If you're citing a web page that doesn't have page numbers, you don't have to put anything in parentheses if you've accounted for the name of the source in the body of the sentence. Um, a lot of my students tend to invent page numbers for web sources. Don't do that. Okay. APA is different from MLA in the sense that they add the year of publication. And this would be a good time to mention, by the way, the difference. Modern Language Association is uh, the organization I belong to. It's about 40,000 people. Uh, and we are people who teach contemporary languages, not just English, but French, German, Dutch, Japanese, uh, any modern language. In fact, at our annual conventions, we have panels that are done entirely in German or entirely in French or entirely in Spanish or entirely in Japanese. I mean, it's always interesting to walk by the international sections. The American Psychological Association is an organization, as the name suggests, of psychologists, but it's about twice the size of MLA. And APA citations are used by far more disciplines. I'll get to that, and I'll come back to that here in a minute. But just so you know what the differences between these two organizations are. This is mostly English teachers. This is a lot of different academic disciplines use APA for a variety of reasons. Um, not all, of, not all of which I know. So anyway, minimum goes in text, just the author last name or short title um, in public, your publication if it's an APA citation. On both cases, the maximum amount of information goes on the works cited or the references page. That's where the author's names, the title of the publication, the title of the article, when it was published, uh, sometimes we include the URL, Universal Resource Locator, that HTTP thing, um, the date of access, the name of a database, uh, things like that. And we have different formats for different sources. And both MLA and APA, though they are similar, will use different formats for the same kinds of sources. The bottom line is you need to pick a system, one that you think is going to be most useful to you, and stay with it. Uh, one of the conventions to think about with both MLA and EPA on the reference list or the works cited page entry, it's considered a special paragraph. And I'll show you some examples of this later in the presentation. We use what's called a hanging indent, where the first line is run out to the left margin and everything is indented below that, so it's the reverse of a regular paragraph. Each element, the author name, the title, the publication data, those are all considered a sentence. Um, we list the author's names first by last name and then uh, the title of the article, then the place and the date of publication. The place, when we say place in academic life, we mean the name of the journal. Um, if it's an article that's been printed someplace, like it's a newspaper article, you would list you know, the author of the title, the name of the newspaper, and then you would include the URL to indicate that it was something that you found online. Okay, and that each entry on a works cited page or a reference page are going to be double spaced and they'll be in the same font as the rest of the paper. Okay. Which system should you pick since they're so similar? Um, again, I've kind of mentioned that MLA is less common uh, and it's designed for use by people in my line of work, but even a lot of our own academic journals for like composition and rhetoric tend to use APA. APA you're going to use in a lot more environments. Business uses APA, geology uses APA, nursing uses APA, um, many social sciences, uh, economics, psychology, sociology, they use APA. Um, so that may be a more useful choice for you. There are templates for both in Word and Google Docs uh, that may help you set up the papers. One of the things that's different about APA is they put a publication date first, and their concern is with the most up-to-date scholarship possible on a given topic. So you'll see, you know, Smith and Smith 2016, and that's because they want to indicate that they found the most up-to-date sources that they can. Okay, but APA is more restrictive in terms of paper layout and language.
So what I suggest you do is pick the one that is most likely to be one that you're going to use in your major. And you're welcome to email me and ask me questions about that. I'd be happy to answer them. What's the difference? Well, a Works Cited page, this is for MLA, you can see the hanging indent feature here where the first line goes out to the margin. And you can see we have the last name and the first name of the author. The second author, first name, last name, you can see the period. Here's the title in quotation marks of the article. Here is the journal it was published in, reference and user services quarterly, the date, the page numbers. Um, Academic search complete is the name of the database. Here's the URL and here's the date of access. Okay, on the APA side, you see something interesting. We have the last name, but instead of a first name, we have initials and we also have a date. One of the reasons that we do this is APA, when it first came out with the new one in 2009, the sixth edition, um, they had first names in it. And many people in the disciplines that use APA said, wait a minute. If we let people's first names be known, then it's going to change the way that people read their citations. Because if you know that somebody's named Tiffany or Crystal, we're going to read that differently from someone named Thomas or John. Because many psychologists argue that there are still many prejudices against women scholars. So APA changed its mind about halfway through, reissued the book, and took out first names. So when you see a citation that has initials, and a last name and a date, you know it's an APA one. And again, you can see how APA is right up here at the front to show that the uh, source is as recent as it can be. This is an old example, uh, but it's one of the few I could find that kind of displays this in an easy way. Notice that both of these are double spaced. Notice that both of these are in alphabetical order by author last name. Okay, that's how these things are set up. And notice there's no bold here at the top. There's no uh, extra spacing. Uh, they're set up in the same way that the rest of the paper is set up. So don't do anything fancy on these things. Okay. MLA changed in April of 2016, introduced this idea of containers. And it also introduces some more flexibility in terms of the ways that uh, an item can be documented. A container is simply where something's been published. It could be a journal in a book, it could be a television episode, and then it could also be where an item can be found, like a database or an online service. And so the idea here that you might have an article or a source that comes in, that actually is in two containers. Let's say you want to talk about um, a, a television show episode. Well, that's going to have a specific title and it's going to be listed as part of a series. And then where did you find it? Well, I found it on Hulu, or I found it through Amazon Prime, or I found it over broadcast television, and that's your second container. And I'll show you some examples of this. It also permits something that is called a document object identifier. This is a relatively new term, and it used to be restricted only to APA documentation, but now MLA uh, lets you use it as well. It's a digital code that lets you go right from that DOI to the article in a database. That's what it's designed to do. But not all databases use them and not articles have been identified with one of these codes. Um, in terms of MLA 8th, in addition to the kinds of things that we've just talked about, about this idea of containers, this idea of using a DOI, um, they've developed a set of principles rather than a list of specific examples. And they have three simple principles. Cite simple traits shared by most works, like an author and a title and page numbers. Okay, Remember, there's more than one way to cite the same source. And the key is to make your documentation useful to readers. This is actually very difficult, I think, because until you know the conventions, uh, it's a little hard to say, how is a reader going to use this? The more work you do with academic journals, the more academic writing you do, the more familiar you get with them. But it's useful always to remember that there are three fundamental principles behind MLA documentation and that many of the decisions that you make are going to be ones that may make sense to you uh, and may make sense to your audience but might look different from somebody else who's citing the same source. And that's okay as long as we can audiences can find where you got your information from. Okay. Uh, again, this is kind of the basic list of, of items that you might see. And if you're missing one of these items, then you just don't worry about it. If you don't have an author, then you go to the title. 
and you know that the title it's going to be one of these two that you've got and then there'll be a title of a container like a like i said a journal or a magazine um, if there's other contributors those are going to be listed with the author if it's an editor that's going to come after the author after the title um, the version um, really applies more to websites uh, than other things um, or it may apply to software or it might apply to a video game and then the location the very last thing is usually a uniform resource locator the url okay and you can see how each of these has a punctuation mark the author is considered a sentence the title of the source is a sentence all this is considered one sentence and i'll show you some examples of these as we go through okay here's one in fact this is the article we use for the summary assignment we got the author's names here last name first name and then first name last name for the second author here's the article title and quotation marks here's the name of the publication this is the first container of the college student journal and here's the publication data the volume the issue number the date the page numbers this is the second container the database and this is the url within that database and then here's the date of access okay so that's what an mla works cited page edition looks like one of the differences you'll see between uh, mla and apa is that apa does not put quotation marks around the article title but mla does both MLA and APA use italics for the name of a journal and the name of a database. I'll show you some examples of that here in a minute. Here's another article. This comes from a database. Uh, this is from, Eb from EBSCO host database, Science Full Text Select. Um, and this is an article. We have the authors. We have the name of the journal. We have the title of the article. And we have this DOI thing. And I'll show you what this looks like in an MLA format citation. It looks like this. we got authors. We've got a title. By the way, I used et al because I've got more than four authors. Um, I've got the name of the publication, which is also the first container. I've got the second one, uh, Science Full Text Select. That's another container. And then instead of a URL, I have this DOI. Okay, let me get my cursor over to here. You can see the DOI now. This would be a hyperlink, and the idea is if you're reading this paper online, you could go right to it by just clicking on the source. Looking on the link, I'm sorry. In APA, this is the same article. Now here in APA, you list all the authors. You use initials rather than their first name. You put the year the article was published up here in the front. Uh, you notice that the article title does not have um, quotation marks around it, uh, but it does have italics used for the name of the journal and also the volume. Don't ask me why they do that. And then the page range. And then here we have the DOI listed. If there were no DOI, you'd have to say retrieved from and you'd put in a URL. Okay. How do you document a website? This is where students really struggle, I think, and it's because they make it harder than they need to. It's like any other source. You got a title of the source, High Times. You've got an article title. Here's the article title, Radical Rant, Marijuana is Imminent, Trump of Palooza. You've got an author down here, and you've got a date. Okay. At the bottom of the page, you're going to have the name of the sponsor. And the name of the sponsor of High Times, the online magazine about marijuana, is High Times. That's their name. Okay. And so we need to have both of those pieces of information in order to make sense of this. Sometimes the only date you're going to find is going to be down here on the bottom as well. And I'll show you an example of that when we get further along. So here we know who the author is. It's Russ Belleville. So in MLA format, here's what it would look like. I got Belleville. I got the title of the article. I've got High Times. I've got the name of the sponsor. I've got the URL so I can find this thing again. I've got the date it was published and the date I accessed it. If I'm doing this in APA, it's very similar. Belleville, and instead of a first name, I use the initial. I put the date. And if I have a day and month, then I put that up here in the front. Notice I've got the title in here without a use of quotation marks. I've got the name of the journal and then I've got the retrieved from and then a URL. Okay. I have to have the URL and retrieve from because this article does not have a DOI, a document object identifier. Only articles in databases have DOIs. Okay. If you don't have an author, what do you do? I still got the same publication. I've got a page title. It's not food recipes. It's not foodie 411. It's the title that's closest to the text. 
That's how we make these decisions. I go down to the bottom of the page. WebMD LLC is the name of the company. And here's my date, 2005 to 2014. I don't need anything more specific than that to create a citation that looks like this. Here it is in MLA. I got the title. I've got the name of the source. I've got the name of the sponsoring organization. I've got the date. I've got the URL, the date of access. And then here, I use the same information, but I don't need quotation marks because it's APA. I put the year up here in the front. I don't know. I put the, this is an MLA or APA rule. You put the date of the last date, the latest date on the website. And then I've got the URL again. Okay. How can you make this easy for yourself? Well, in Pearson Writer, there's a tool that will help you set up a project and then will let you create citations and save them into your paper. On our Blackboard site, I've got another tool called Noodle Tools, and then I've got Handouts and Writing Center. These are going to be your best places to go. We're at the end of this group of slides. I know I've covered a lot, and I know for many of you, talking about documentation is really boring. Okay. Um, if that's the case, then please use some of the tools that are built into Blackboard and built into Pearson Writer to help you out. And as always, you're welcome to ask me questions. I'm, I'm easy to talk to when it comes to this. I'm fascinated by documentation, and I'm glad to help you in any way I can. I should mention just one other point. I'm not interested so much in zapping you for plagiarism or for making a mistake. I'm really interested in making sure that you understand how these systems work so that you can use them to your advantage. We're going to be talking a lot more when we get to integrating sources about how to make documentation work in your behalf inside the body of your paper. I'm not here to get you. I'm here to help you. I really mean that. Okay, so if you have questions, and I hope you do, please email me and let me know. Thank you for your attention.